I am very grateful that Jesus says in Revelation that we have an open door in front of us. Well, hello, church family and friends. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Pray with me, will you? Dear Father, God over all the families of the earth, together right now, we as a family of faith, as the community uh, of DRCC, we pray for your spirit as we open your word that we might understand better what it means to walk with and trust in your son, our Savior and Lord. In his name we pray, amen, amen. Well, first thing I wanna do is share with you a powerful story, really a vision that I hope you will remember and put everything that comes in the rest of this message in its context. Rodney Stark was a distinguished professor, is a distinguished professor of sociology at Baylor University, and he gained national attention with his landmark study, look at it with me, The Rise of Christianity, and I don't know if you can see the subtitle, very interesting subtitle, How the Obscure Marginal Jesus Movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world in just a few centuries. Now, what gave this book its impact is that Rodney Stark did not did not base his research on, he did not even factor in one way or the other, you know, uh, for or against, but he did not base his research on any supernatural element. His book is not a modern telling of the book of Acts uh, that describes the birth and growth of the church from a very God-centered, spirit-moving, Christ-honoring perspective. Actually, what Stark does is after a couple of really boring chapters of statistical analysis that show us how quickly uh, Christianity expanded in such a short time, then Stark turns his attention to trying to explain for us the growth of the early church. He looks at factors that made Christianity this powerful, rapidly expanding circle of all types of people, all classes of people, all designations of people in the Roman Empire, but he does it, please hear this, purely through the testimony of the eyewitness onlookers. In other words, we're seeing the story of the growth of the church through uh, converts, through hostile Roman officials, through uh, pagans that considered Christians their enemies. We are experiencing this expansion through these eyewitness accounts, and what emerges is amazing. According to these eyewitnesses, the Christian movement exploded out into the Roman Empire, city by city, because the gospel of Jesus Christ created in those early believers this sustained, I think, from a human perspective, illogical and sacrificial compassion and generosity that was coupled with their consistent commitment to a whole new concept in humanity, a whole new concept. The Greeks had never believed this, nobody had ever believed this, and this new concept was the equal value of every single human life. They, they believed this because they believed that Jesus Christ had died on the cross, not just for the rich, but for the poor, not just for the master, but for the slave, not just for the adult, but for the child, not just for men, but for women, not just for whites, but for blacks, not just for Jews, but for Greeks. And because of this, they, they held up this, this absolute dignity and value of all human life. It played itself out in many ways. You know, uh, we're experiencing a pandemic, but in those days, there were worse plagues. And as those plagues hit cities and the pagans ran out of the cities, leaving even children and spouses and siblings to die on their own, the Christians went in. They went in to care for those in need. There was the whole drama of, uh, in the Roman world of unwanted babies. Often if a baby, and often even more often if it was a female baby, if a baby was born and for whatever reason 
it was somehow marred, a birthmark, uh, wrong gender, if it was unwanted, then the Romans actually had a practice of taking that baby outside the city gate to the garbage heap where there were lots of dogs, lots of scavengers, and just laying it there to, to let nature take its course. But the early Christians went every morning to those garbage heaps. They rescued those babies and they raised them as their own children. I, I wish every woman could read, really read the history of the, of the early church in relation to women. Women saw in Christianity a whole new opportunity of dignity. They were given a voice. They were given roles of authority. They, the church was the first organization to stand against child bride marriages where little girls, nine and 10 years old, were often married off to men three or four times their age. The church stood against the practice of killing or sell selling female babies simply because they were female and the family wanted a male. The church stood against slavery and it did it, it had no power to overturn slavery, but it did it by undermining slavery with an ethic of human equality. <clears throat> if you wanna see this probably most beautifully in a tight um, package in the Bible, then just look at Galatians 3, verse 26 to 29, and picture that being said in a culture filled with slaves. Because in Galatians 3, 26, Paul starts out with these stunning words. He says, you are all the children of God. And then he says, therefore, there is now neither Jew nor Greek. There's not male or female. There's not slave or free. You know, he just, he just levels the playing field, and he says, we are all one in Christ. Now imagine a Christian master and a Christian slave in a room together hearing that. Because of that, within several centuries, slavery was gone in Christendom. There was their relation to the orphans who were sold often when, when children lost both parents, the relatives would sell them into slavery. But the Christians would actually buy them back and raise them as family members. The external, visible draw of Christianity, Rodney Stark shows, for those who were outside the early church and for those who came in was this Christian refusal to tolerate, to turn away from, to quietly ignore injustice. In fact, one of the best quotes in the whole book is a quote by uh, the last Roman emperor, he was known as Justinian the Apostate, who after uh, Constantine had made Christianity the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, Justinian tried to repaganize the empire, but there was a problem, and he writes to the pagan priests, and he says, the problem is, that these Galileans, which was his word for the Christians, these Galileans care more about your people than you do. They do more for pagans than their own priests. The Christians did not fight violence with violence. They did not deal with injustice through retribution, but they courageously and sacrificially put their lives their careers, their finances, and their status on the line to end injustice, to heal and to protect the most vulnerable. And at great cost, those early Christians changed the world. Okay, this is our, that, remember that. This is our second message on the final book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. The first pre-recorded message in this series, just as the horror of George Floyd's murder stunned America, frankly, for me, sounded tone deaf to that whole situation. So I was all in uh, for letting Pastor Paul Foss step in last week to help begin an ongoing congregational conversation on how we as a community of faith can be part of a positive movement, not just a moment and then back to normal, but a movement to help shape a better country and a better region that we live in. I hope that today can be a next step. And I think in, in order for uh, all of you who are listening to better hear, uh, to, for us to better hear each other, I wanna first speak about three groups that I love. 
You know, years ago, I used to belong to a men's Bible study table, and we dubbed ourselves the cops, the crooks, and the clergy. And we did that because actually at the table, we had three police officers, we had three men who had been convicted of felons, and we had three clergy and a couple other people. So we, we called ourselves the cops, the crooks, and the clergy. In that spirit, I want to talk to three groups, about three groups of people very quickly today. The, those three are the pastors, the police, and the protesters. Now, I have known personally at least 200 pastors. I've known pastors from British Columbia to Honduras, from Hong Kong, to my beloved gang right here in Frederick. I have known at least 200 pastors, and during all my 46 years of ministry, and knowing all those pastors, I personally knew three pastors who deeply violated the trust they had as pastors, who abused the, the responsibility, the authority, the opportunity they were given to represent God in a community of faith. One abused a child, another was a serial um, adulterer, and another stole money. Now, those three represented less than 2% of all the pastors I have ever known. And I want to tell you, the other 190-some or 200 other pastors that I've known personally were all men and women of integrity. They were all people that cared deeply about God's calling on their life. They sacrificially did their best to build up the community of faith. Those few didn't negate all those pastors. I have known well maybe three police officers uh, excuse me, maybe 30 police officers in my life, and most of them right here at DRCC. And what I've known about every single officer is that every single one of them deeply impressed me as men. I've, I've not had the privilege of knowing well any female officers, but men of heart, character, and courage. In fact, I, I was telling Sally, if I had to do you know, a, a six-month trek into a wilderness with just a few men, and I got to choose the men I was doing it with, I would say that uh, on my short list would be Bob Angelino, Brian Dillman, and Don Freetag, all three police officers. Now, Brian told me there are over a million officers in the United States, a million, about a million police officers. In the 67 years of life, I've seen personally, uh, on two occasions, what I would call bad cops use undue force with clear racial bigotry. The huge majority of police stand with all of us who would condemn that. The, the huge majority of police are people that go into the line of duty to help preserve and protect life. They should not be undone by that percentage that uh, abuses its power. Finally, it is estimated that in the last 12 days, about 3% of the American population, about 3% have actually participated in protests. In fact, many of you listening may have been a part of that. 3% doesn't sound like much, but if you do the math, that's about 11 million Americans. Now, in a dozen or so cities, some of those protesters were infiltrated by looters, by criminals, by hooligans. Uh, I, I have no figure on that, but let's say, I think this is wildly exaggerated, but let's say there were 10,000 people who actually participated in that kind of vandalism. Do you know that even if there were 10,000, which no one is claiming there was, I just picked that number, if there were 10,000, that would be one one thousandth of one percent of protesters. One one thousandth of one percent of all the protesters. Brian Dillman, my uh, officer friend, told me that he and his officers have protected and ensured the right 
of over 40 protests in the first week of protests and not one of them turned violent, no, no destruction of property. So again, friends, let's be very careful because the huge majority of protesters are actually trying to use a, a, a right they have as citizens to speak. Let's not negate all that because of a very small fraction. Truth is, every large group is composed of, every large group is composed of 100% flawed human beings. And a very small percentage of those flawed humans are actually sick and evil. But the vast majority in every one of these categories is so good. Okay, now, let's get to our, our theme for today. George Floyd's murder impacted our nation. It's impacting this series. Instead of focusing uh, in, in the next two weeks on biblical tools to enhance your own capacity to dig into the truths of Revelation, I want to spend today and next week using Revelation, allowing Revelation to give us a biblical framework to our current national crisis and the discussion we're having over racial justice. Today is going to be a tough message. I'm just going to be honest with you. Because today, I want our focus to look f deeply at how Revelation defines our root problem and how that plays into this situation. Next week, we'll flip the coin and focus on the real answer Revelation gives to this root problem and on the church's part in providing that answer for the world. And together, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper. Okay, here we go. If you read Revelation carefully, you will be struck by how much space is devoted to detailing God's description of and God's retributive judgment on an entity called Babylon. Revelation has seven major sections, seven sections, and two of those seven Four of its 22 chapters are dedicated to describing for us what Babylon is, why it must come down, and how it will come down in order for the kingdom of God to flourish and rise up. You know, the most frequent message of Revelation, and we're going to be looking at this deeply next week, the most frequent message is its call for us to truly trust and follow the Lamb, Jesus Christ our Lord, as the Lamb wherever He leads, allowing Him to both save our life and to shape our life. But the most frequent warning, the most negative message in Revelation is its insistence that there is this counterfeit kingdom that is offering a counterfeit gospel and it is called Babylon. And whatever this entity, this spirit of Babylon is, it is equally as worldwide as the church of Jesus Christ. Revelation pictures Babylon as firmly in the driver's seat of the world's power structures in this age. Yet it also pictures Babylon as demonic and doomed, as destined to receive in the same spirit that she gave the full cup of God's wrath, unmixed with mercy. Revelation makes it clear that to truly live in the kingdom of God now and in eternity is to not be at home in Babylon. So, Babylon, what is it? Where is it? Who is it? The most detailed description begins in Revelation 17 to 1, verses 1 to 6. Actually, it, it begins in Revelation 17, goes all the way through Revelation 18. But I want you to look at with me at the first, just the first five or six verses. And I will just tell you in advance, they start confusing and complex, and it only gets worse. We need to unpack these verses. Revelation 17, 1 says this, One of the angels who had the seven bowls, came to me and said, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth, verse 2, with her, the kings of the earth committed. Now, in your Bible, if you're looking at your Bible, it, it, depending on your translation, it says committed either adultery 
or fornication or sexual immorality. But what I've tried to do in these slides is each time use the original Greek word. It says they committed pornea. Pornea is all of those three and more. Pornea is the, is the word that means a twisted and perverted use of intimacy for the sake of selfish gain with no valuing of the person involved. It's the word that we draw our, our, our term pornography from. And, it, and pornography, I think, captures it. Pornea is using people as objects for selfish gratification. And the kings of the earth, it says, committed pornea with her. Now catch this, and all those dwelling on the earth are intoxicated with the wine of her pornea. Wow. Verse 3. So the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. Interestingly, that's also where it says the church is, but he carries me into a wilderness. And there I saw this woman sitting uh, on a scarlet beast, a beast that was covered with blasphemous names, covered with names. I think that's Revelation's way of saying whatever this beast spirit is, and we'll be talking more about that in further messages, it is, it, that, this beast has appeared many times with many identities. It's held many names. And this beast, like the dragon that incarnated it, this beast has seven heads. Heads signify rulers symbolically. It, and seven, a totality, a fullness. It's, the, it's a fullness of rulers and ten horns, which signify power or kingdoms. Ten is the number for human kingdoms. This beast embodies so much of all the power structures of history. And the woman rides it. Verse 4, the woman also was dressed in purple and scarlet. She was glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. She held in her hand, surprisingly, not a, a scepter of rulership, but a gold cup that she holds out. But God says it's filled with abominations and the filth of her twisted pornea. You know, abominations is not a word that most of us use, but it means a thing or act or attitude that is absolutely abhorrent to God. She's holding out a cup that in many ways is tempting to all of us, but abhorrent to God. And then in verse 5, it says, And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon, the great. Babylon, the mega. This, this spirit that wants to be seen as great, that wants to lift itself up and make itself great, it says she is the mother of all harlots and of all the abominations of the earth. Well, the description goes on, and we could just keep detailing it, but if we jump ahead to verse 15, it tells us one other thing very important. It says, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute, literally in the Greek it's a very derogatory term, the great whore, but where the prostitute sits are people, multitudes, nations, and languages. Now, again, I will tell you, we haven't been able to do this in detail together, but anytime there's a fourfold designation of different people groups, that is Revelation's way of saying this is a worldwide phenomena. The woman impacts the whole world. Now let's jump back for just a minute to Revelation 16, 19, where it actually, in advance of this great description, gives us her destiny. It says in Revelation 16, 19, And Babylon the great was remembered before God. He gave her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. Let me net that out for you. You don't want to be in Babylon on Judgment Day. So once again, wow, where is Babylon? What is Babylon? Who is Babylon? I'm going to give you four characteristics right now that, I, that we draw from the text itself that help us understand what this symbol of Babylon is. Number one, Babylon is everywhere. Babylon is worldwide. 
three times we're told in Revelation that all nations have been intoxicated by Babylon. We're told twice that every person is allured by Babylon. Even John, when he sees her, it says he marvels. And the word marvel there, some translations translate astonish, but the word marvel means he's drawn, like, you know, the Marvel comic books want to draw us into these super... John is drawn, and the angel says, why are, you, why are you drawn by her? I mean, even John. So, so all people have been allured by Babylon. What this means, friends, is to try to make Babylon, this symbol of Babylon, into just one nation, just one empire, just one particular organization, religious or secular, one people group, is so missing the point. Babylon has intoxicated all the nations. Ancient Greece, Rome, Babylon itself. In modern times, it's intoxicated Great Britain, China, Russia, and America. Number two, Babylon is an Old Testament symbol. It is actually a code in the Old Testament that's used repeatedly by the prophets for the spirit of opposition to God's will and to God's word. It is the intractable enemy of the covenant that God is trying to build with the people of the earth. And I'll come back to this one. But number two, it is a, it is a symbol or a code for opposition to the will and work of God. Number three, Babylon, which is pictured as a harlot dressed in scarlet, is actually the satanic counterfeit of Christ's new community, the church. The church in Revelation 12, verse 1, is pictured as this woman dressed with the sun, standing on the moon with 12 stars, a crown of 12 stars. Uh, and now she is the bride of Christ, and this prostitute symbol of Babylon is the counterfeit of that. What we have, you know, Revelation has often been called the story of two women, a tale of two cities, two women representing two cities, Babylon and the New Jerusalem, representing two different spirits at work in humanity and two different destinies. But remember, she is not uh, the visible, intractable enemy, Babylon isn't, of the New Jerusalem. She is a counterfeit. And counterfeits are only as good as their capacity into deceiving us into believing that what is being offered through the counterfeit is the real deal. Number four, Babylon. This one really stunned me. Let me just remind you of where we've come. Babylon is everywhere. She's a symbol of opposition to God's will and work. She is a counterfeit of the true people of God. And finally, number four, this is the stunner. The, by, the book of Revelation says Babylon is responsible for every single person who has been slain, whose life has been violently taken away from them in all of history throughout over the whole face of the earth. Look at it with me. In Revelation 18, 24, it says, in her, in Babylon, was found the blood of all the prophets, all the saints, now catch this, and of all who have been slain on the earth. Now twice earlier, John tells us that Babylon, uh, the, the, the ultimate outgrowth of Babylon is her willingness to kill and destroy the prophets and the martyrs. But now John expands this stunning claim and he tells us that every single slain man or woman or child on earth, all of them are victims of Babylon. They died because of what Babylon does in the souls and hearts and spirits of people, all who have been slain, all the way back to Abel, Zechariah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, our Lord Jesus Christ himself, John the Baptist, Lincoln, Gandhi, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King. Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. All the police who have been, the police operating out of integrity who have been shot in the line of duty, just 
Put your arms around every single person who has lost their life violently, and and we are told that they all lost their lives because of Babylon, who wants to always call herself great, mega. And so, for the third time, let me say it. What is Babylon? Where is Babylon? Who is Babylon? The symbol of Babylon, I've already said this once, but let me say it again, is drawn from the Old Testament. And there Babylon came to represent far more than one literal pagan empire located on the Euphrates River that destroyed Solomon's temple and carried the Jewish people into captivity for seven decades. It came to represent far more than that. Three verses from the Old Testament that are commonly used by Jewish scholars to help describe Babylon will help us. The first is Genesis 11, verse 4. It shows us that the root of the word Babylon is Babel, and it's the story of the Tower of Babel. And I want you to just look at the core verse of this story, where it says that the people of of, of the, the plain of Shinar came together, and they said this to themselves. They said, come, let us build for ourselves a tower by which we can climb to heaven. Let us, let us manufacture our own salvation. Let us make for ourselves a name so that we will not be scattered across the earth. The second verse is Daniel 4, verse 30. I think you're going to start to hear a common thread. This is actually a verse about Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of literal Babylon. And it says that he is walking on the roof of his royal palace and he looks out over the great city that he's constructed and his spirit comes pouring out of him. And this is what he says. Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as my royal residence by the power of my strength and for the glory of my majesty. And probably the most stunning use of Babylon in the whole Old Testament is found in the prophet Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, where in in, uh, Isaiah 14, starting at verse 9, Isaiah begins this dirge, this lament, this funeral song over the kingdom of Babylon and the king of Babylon. But suddenly, in verse 12, he drops back and he goes deeper into what spirit inspires the spirit of Babylon. And he says this, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, which literally means O morning star, O son of the dawn. For you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will rise, raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the Mount of Assembly. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself, you almost want to hit a pause there, I will make myself my own little God. I will make myself like the Most High. In this passage, seven times Satan says, I, me, my. Seven times Satan says his ultimate dream is a life, a name, an influence that centers on himself, that, is, that exists to bring glory to himself. And so long ago, the Jewish sages and prophets said that Babylon was this symbol for human selfishness, for a preoccupation with self, for the pursuit and protection of the self-centered, prideful prestige and comfort and control where everything else was secondary to that agenda. Actually, friends, it's always stunned me, and you can do this study right through the New Testament. The Bible does not describe satanic as something that is grossly vile, evil, wicked, dark. It says that to be satanic is simply to be intensely absorbed in constructing and controlling my little kingdom of self where God may be believed in, certainly Satan himself believes in God, where God may be believed in, but God and everything else is secondary to my personal agenda, my wants, my goals. Now, Revelation dips back and picks that symbol and that theme up, and it applies it at a personal and at a national 
level. So many years ago, now I'm, I'm just going to give you my story, many, many years ago when I really first dug into this book of Revelation and was reading through it carefully for the first time and I came to God's divine assessment of and verdict on Babylon, I realized that Revelation chapter 18, the whole chapter is John, or if you will, the Holy Spirit hitting the pause button to give us a more detailed look at the spirit of Babylon, a sort of drawing back the curtain look at Babylon through the eyes of those most in bed with her, most addicted to her, and most terrified of losing her. And in that chapter, Revelation 18, two more aspects of Babylon emerged. And I'm going to just tell you honestly from my heart, these two aspects stunned me and they deeply convicted me, and they still do. The first of these two is that while Babylon is described as demonic and ultimately cruel, her seductive power is in something much more benign, much more palatable. It is a list, it is a, it is, her, the, the spirit of Babylon is a devaluing of life in the pursuit and protection of personal and national economic affluence. It is stunning. The whole chapter of, of Revelation 18 that goes deep into Babylon is a discussion of economy, but it's in, in a certain light. Babylon devalues human life in her pursuit of affluence, <clears throat> and that, that affluence is her life's highest priority. Right at the heart of John's description of Babylon, he gives us this detailed list of her priorities, her functional value statement, and it's wrapped up in the cargoes that she values. And when you read this, you're reading along and you're not really prepared for what comes at the end because it starts out and it says, Babylon, she hungers, she longs for, she thirsts for cargoes of gold and silver. Gold and silver. money, for, give me my, give me affluence, give me wealth, gold and silver. And then it goes through a list of five sort of upscale uh, products of stuff that is, you know, you would say would give you status and prestige, kind of a Neiman Marcus Gucci a list of, of acquisitions, and then it lists some assets, and then right at the bottom, it says, cargoes of gold and silver first, and the bodies and souls of people last. Let me say that again. Babylon, the spirit of Babylon, is gold and silver first, people last. Gold and silver, all the stuff I can get with that, oh yes, and people. My escalating prosperity is the driving force of my life, the needs of other people later. Babylon, friends, is not pictured as an involuntary and trapped sex slave. She's not some impoverished woman forced to sell her body to preserve the life of a child. She is a proud, professional, successful harlot. She is a woman intent, a spirit intent on promoting and reproducing and protecting all that makes her lifestyle possible. She views people, she views all human relationships primarily in transactional value added ways. Those people who are not assets, they're expendable, they're ignorable. Other people have value to the degree they enhance her personal pursuit of profit and upward mobility. In her list of priorities, you've got to realize injustice is not so much endorsed as simply ignored. Whatever is going around in, or whatever is going on around or in Babylon, the bottom line is the bottom line. The great characteristic, the great um, sort of response of Babylon to injustice is apathy, silence, and indifference, unless somehow that injustice begins to negatively impact her lifestyle. 
I want you to notice this. I'm drilling down here on this point. John doesn't say that Babylon gives no value to people's lives and souls. Her agenda is not overtly dark or gross or sinister acts against all people, but Babylon is simply most about her own personal peace, her own untroubled life, her own comfort and security. Babylon is our busyness that consumes us so much that our whole life is simply about protecting our own personal peace comfort, and affluence to the point we consciously or unconsciously diminish, neglect, or simply ignore the suffering and the needs of others. Let me say it one more time. There is no overt cruelty necessary to live in Babylon, just apathy, just the indifference of self-absorbed lives. Now I said that that was the first thing that blew me away. It was the first thing I will say quite honestly that shook my religious comfort zone and complacency. But the second was even more disconcerting. The second thing Revelation 18 said. Because right in the middle of this detailed description of the spirit of Babylon, God pauses and he turns and he, drink, he speaks directly to his own people, and he speaks to us in a command. He doesn't say, stay away from Babylon. He doesn't say, speak out against Babylon. He says, look at it with me, in Revelation 18, 4, he says, come out of her, my people. Let me say that again. God's word to us about this spirit is come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. God first defines Babylon as the basis of all injustice, all violence through its apathetic pursuit of its own comfortable lifestyle. And then God turns to us, his own people, and he says, if you really want to see where, what, or who has been infected, who to some degree has been intoxicated by Babylon, look in the mirror. That one shook me up. God says this in love. He says, recognize the problem. Be honest. Come out. And what's interesting, friends, is that this is God's last piece of advice given directly to his church, to his own people, before final judgment begins, before it falls in Revelation. In other words, friends, this call is serious. Come out of her, my people. In the same way, Laodicea is the last of seven churches in Revelation 2 to 3 that Jesus speaks to. Jesus tells them that he is actually about to vomit them out of his mouth, and then he gives the reason why, and it's stunning. He says, I'm about to, to spit you out of my mouth because you say, you say, I am rich. I'm increased with goods. I have need of nothing. And then he adds this, but you do not know. You don't realize that in this pursuit of this lifestyle, your apathy, your indifference, has caused you to appear before God as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and then most stunning of all is naked. That means devoid, devoid of the righteousness of Christ, naked. Friends, coming out of Babylon is not changing our location. It is a change in our affections. It is ending our rationalizations. It is reordering our prior priorities. Coming out of Babylon is literally becoming aware. So, wow. By talking about Babylon today, am I again guilty of being tone deaf as our nation reels from the murder of George Floyd and from the protests that event has sparked around the world? I hope not. Now I want to move into application. 
Because you see, Revelation tells me to view this tragedy, to view this tragedy first as a man who is staring at my own reflection, as a man who is looking at the past and present role of the church, as a man who is reflecting on our national life, and he's asking us to look at all of that in the mirror called Babylon and to determine to come out. Let me be specific. Revelation's description of Babylon makes it clear that unity is not achieved by silence. It is not achieved by avoidance in the face of deep and complex injustice. We cannot be the people of God by not acting because we do not like the way others are reacting in the face of injustice. Unity cannot be achieved in the face of injustice by finding reasons to rationalize apathy and to stay uninvolved. So listen, 10, 12 days ago, the pastors and the elders of this church in a unified way decided that they believed the cold, calloused execution of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin as both white and black onlookers, along with George Floyd himself, begged for his life. They saw that as not just an isolated case, but as part of a systematic problem. And so they invited Paul to help us begin a movement, let me say it again, a movement, not just a reactive moment, to address to address the injustice that caused it. And so everything else I'm gonna say right now is my uh, shot in the light of the root problem that Revelation describes in our lives is my shot at helping us frame that moment. Friends, our nation began with a document called the Declaration of Independence, and that document became a beacon of light for over a hundred other nations that would come after us. It said that all men, and ultimately, finally, thankfully, women, but all men and women are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That, That tricky word, inalienable, root word, by the way, is alien. Inalienable rights means that no one can rightly take away these rights. These rights cannot be rightly taken away. And then the very man that wrote those words, Thomas Jefferson and all the rest of our founding fathers decided to stay completely silent in our new constitution of the United States on what Jefferson himself repeatedly called the economically necessary evil of race-based slavery, which was already over 160 years old in America. But our founding fathers, this is... Friends, this is the amniotic fluid in which the baby of the United States was born. Our founding fathers agreed together to count black people as three-fifths human. That meant they had no rights, but what it meant is they could be counted as bodies to give legislative power to the South with its millions of slaves but fewer whites. Friends, that is our history, and that is Babylon. This law, seeing black men, women, and children as three-fifths human, paved the way for the White House, for for our chief executive office to be occupied by slave-owning Southerners or slave-supporting Northerners in all but 12 of the first 72 years of the United States. Only two presidents a father and a son, John Adams and John Quincy Adams, actively spoke out against slavery, and because of that, neither was reelected. Friends, that is our American history, our heritage, and that is Babylon. The primary reason that this brand new nation, the United States, rose so quickly in the world, on the world stage as an economic and international power is that we, in the early years of this country, we had one major huge advantage over every other European country. For the first 80 years of this country, our major cash crop, our major export to other nations that brought in more than twice 
the funds of all our other exports combined was cotton. Cotton drove the growth of American textiles, shipping, banking industry, and international loans. And friends, every bale of cotton was planted, nurtured, harvested, and loaded on the ships by slaves, by black people who received no wages, had no rights, who were brutalized, murdered at will, separated from their families for profit. Three million slaves, billions of hours of labor and unimaginable suffering and cruelty and no compensation. You know, I love to hear the stories of how our white immigrant ancestors, or perhaps, uh, perhaps you, uh, but how our ancestors, whether they be Italians, Irish, Polish, Germans, Eastern Europeans, Asians, Hispanics, how they came to this country and they came poor. Nobody gave them anything. Everything they got, they worked for, sacrificed, suffered to make a better life. But friends, when I listen to these stories, we have to realize that we or none of our ancestors were slaves. None of them were legally sold, beaten, or murdered because they were viewed as not really human. They and we, their white ancestors, we know nothing of that collective trauma. And that is our history. And that is Babylon. I want you to look at the title of this book. It's from the, the series, a series of books, The Oxford University History of America. That This series has won two Pulitzer Prize, two National Book Awards. This book won the National Book Award. It's called What Hath God Wrought? It shows brilliantly brilliantly that from 1815 right up to 1860 in the beginning of the Civil War, Every major law, every major legislative decision that was enacted by Congress or by the Senate was designed to support and protect slavery. Every one. That's American history. And that's Babylon. After the Civil War, which cost us more than half a million men and cost Abraham Lincoln his life, we began the era of Reconstruction in the South. Reconstruction gave the freed millions of black people in the South genuine rights, genuine opportunities. Reconstruction lasted only 12 years. During those years, Zealous Christian abolitionist educators from the North flocked South and they opened up schools to educate the illiterate children and teens of slavery. And friends, those black parents who had been slaved, they sacrificed to send thousands of their children to these schools. They told them to work hard, to learn well. And after just five years of reconstruction, President Ulysses S. Grant's envoy to the South gave this report to Congress that if the growth in black literacy stays constant for just one more decade, there will be more literate blacks than whites in the South. Friends, that was terrifying to the white superiority in this nation. That was terrifying to the white Southerners who for years had convinced themselves, their children, that blacks were inferior, that actually the literacy rate of blacks could go rise, or that helped fuel the rise of the Klan. It brought about the collapse of Reconstruction. Those schools were closed or burned down. Their teachers were driven out or lynched, and Jim Crow laws took away the rights again, all the way through to the midpoint of the 20th century. That's our history. And that is Babylon. My son Luke went to uh, NYU Law School, and there he spent two of his internships, and then the first two years of his professional life after law school working with a man named Brian Stevenson and with his organization, the Equal Justice Initiative, that's located in Montgomery 
Alabama. There's been a film made about Brian Stevenson. I would strongly encourage you watch it. It's based on the title of his book. Book's even better in the film, but the film was called Just Mercy. Now, one of Luke's jobs, I wish I could give you the backstory of why Brian asked him to do it. I'll just tell you quickly, it had some to do with the fact that he was a pastor's son, but Luke's job was to help do research and gather jars of earth from jars of earth and and the picture you're looking at represents just 400 of those jars i want to say that because we're going to shift pictures a minute those are 400 but they were to gather jars of earth from the 4075 documented documented sites of black lynchings in just 12 southern states over just 70 years from 1880 to 1950. Since then, that work has expanded to other states and ultimately that 4,000 number is now growing beyond 6,000 documented lynchings. Friends, many of these lynchings, many of them were public events. They were community celebrations. They were often held on Sundays in the town square after church. The place and the time of the lynching would be published in advance in white newspapers. The white population brought their children. They brought picnic lunches. The crimes for which these black men and women and children were publicly executed for were not typically even felons according to the law of the United States. They were transgressions against the code of white supremacy. Let me say one more thing about that. The majority of these lynchings happened not early in those years back in the 19th century, but in three decades of the 20th century. If I, if, you know, if I took time to tell you some of the stories of why people were lynched. I think it would be hard for you to believe. Actually, interestingly, today as we tape this message, as we get ready for the virtual services, today is the 99th anniversary of the destruction of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Greenwood District was 22 blocks of Tulsa, Oklahoma that became known as the Black Wall Street. It was originally quadrant off where the Negroes, the blacks, were told to live. And they were just basically given this one bad area of Tulsa and they turned that area into such a prosperous area of Tulsa that it was known throughout the country as the Black Wall Street. There was, there were hundreds of businesses, black owned businesses, there were theaters and banks and art galleries, all black owned. And the prosperity of that black district became such an offense to the white people of Tulsa that when a rumor started that was later shown to be false, a rumor started that a black man had raped a white woman, then the resident, the white residents of Tulsa on this day, 99 years ago, rampaged and rioted through the Greenwood district they destroyed over 100 businesses. They burned to the ground 12 blocks of homes. They murdered, the lowest estimate is 36, the highest is somewhere above 100. They murdered people in their homes and on the streets because they were black. That was 99 years ago. T.D. TD Jakes recently, who's 62 years old, said his grandfather was murdered. But here's the punchline. Here's the punchline for today. Here's what I want you and me to hear and think about. As these black lynchings occurred year after year after year, not just as this this looting and destruction of black property occurred, as black churches were burned down and black schools were burned down year after year after year. Each year, blacks murdered without due process by the dozens and dozens. The black Christian pastors of America appealed to their white 
evangelical Christian brethren. Will you help us? Will you join us? Will you simply speak out? Now please hear me and please hear my spirit. The consistent answer by the white church right up to 1950 and still sometimes today was that this was a social justice issue. This was an issue of politics and law. And in order to stay focused on the pure gospel, the true gospel, the white church must not get involved in a social gospel. And so the white church stayed silent. Friends, that is American history. That is still too often our current history. And that is Babylon. We could go on and on, right up to today's news. But let's close with Jesus. In Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus promises us there is a day coming when he is gonna bring about the renewal of all things, including true justice for all. True justice for all. But friends, church, between today and that day, when true justice will come, friends, it's just us. Until Jesus brings in fully true justice, there's just us. We are on this side of eternity. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the ones that are called to be the bringers of his justice. In Jesus' most detailed description of final judgment, of final justice, they're the same word, Those who are truly his people are invited into eternity. They are invited by Jesus into eternity because they did not rationalize, stereotype, exploit, or simply turn away from and ignore in quiet apathy the refugee, the impoverished, the imprisoned, or This one's important, the stranger, which means the other, the one that's different, the one we don't know and doesn't look, act, think like us, the stranger outside of their comfort zone, their circle of comfort. Instead, Jesus looks at those he invites into his kingdom and he says this over him. This is his great benediction. He says, Inasmuch to the degree that you did something for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. You were doing it for me. In anticipation of that day, friends, he says, especially to us, to whom much has been given, much will be expected. From those who had more, more will be demanded. Come out of her, my people. Next week, we're going to go to the solution side. We're going to talk about the call of Jesus to create, to build, and to be a part of the church's answer to human injustice. I hope you'll be here for that message. It'll be a little easier, I think, to swallow than this one. Now, if you're new, I want to invite you to a Zoom hangout where you can ask me and some of our other leaders any questions that you might have. The information is there for you. I hope you can join us. Let's pray. Lord God, with all my heart, I thank you that when, um, that when we're not where we should be, you don't write us off. You come and make an appeal to us. And in this last piece of advice that you give to your church, may we as your people not close our minds and hearts, not shut our doors and not turn away. May we hear you say to us about this whole pervasive spirit of Babylon, come out of her, my people. I do not want you to partake of her sins. I do not want you to receive of her plagues. May we begin that change of orientation that helps us put not gold and silver, but people first, lives first. May we not simply dismiss the needs of those around us because of issues about property. God, may we be the people who step out of our comfort zones and help right now on this side of eternity begin to build that which will be so fully visible on that side. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.